All right, good evening, everybody. I am Jeff Colton, senior reporter with City and State, and it's my pleasure to introduce everybody to uh, our annual Labor 40 Under 40 event, honoring uh, some of the rising stars in New York's labor movement. Uh, this is a big anniversary. This is the one year anniversary of City and State's last in-person event. And it's really killing me. You know, if this were an in-person event, we would have a whole bar, we would have drinks named after, uh, you know, parts of the labor movement. I was trying to dream them up. I was like, screwdriver, uh, maybe a painkiller. <laughs> Uh, if anybody has some ideas, please throw those in the chat. Uh, we'll save them. We'll do them next year at the Labor 40 Under 40. Uh, instead, all I've got is a cup of water, but we're doing our best. Uh, it's been a really big week for the labor movement as well. Um, I'm sure many of you watched uh, Meghan Markle, the, the princess of the, the United Kingdom, standing up for labor, saying that uh, you know SAG-AFTRA, when she was a member, would have stood up for her in a way that the crown itself didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, it was funny, but it was also, it was really amazing. It was really amazing for her to do that. Uh, so we tried to get Meghan Markle to join us tonight. She said she couldn't, but uh, we got some other stars of the labor movement who I will introduce uh, soon. But first, I wanted to thank our sponsors. Uh, that is Teamsters Local 456, the United Federation of Teachers, and Local 764 of IATSE, I-A-T-S-E. Uh, thank you so much to the sponsors tonight uh, for, for helping us. And I think that's it. I, you know, look, I'm sorry if I missed some sponsors. There's a, <laughs> just, there's a lot of unions that are here supporting. Um, and we have five incredible panelists joining us here today. That's Barbara Bowen, Kyle Bragg, Pat Kane, Louis Picani, and Wayne Spence. And uh, I'm going to throw it to them, actually, to introduce themselves, because we're going to have a 45-minute roundtable or so talking about the labor movement. And then at the end, I'm going to shout out our incredible 40 under 40 uh, on the labor list. Uh, so with that, I have, uh, I have warned our panelists and I want the first question, uh, I want all of them to briefly introduce themselves. And then in a minute, in one minute, just tell me what is one reason for optimism in the labor movement or your sector of the labor movement. It's been a hard year. We really are hitting on that one year anniversary. Uh, and this is a, an event that's looking towards the future to the rising stars. So what is a reason for optimism? And uh, I will start with uh, Pat Kane of Nisna. Go ahead, Pat. I think you're on mute, sir. Yeah, I was muted. Of course, I. well, I've gotten that over with, right, Jeff? So we're good now. Um, but really, Jeff, thank you, thanks to you and thanks to everyone. Thanks to City and State for having me here tonight. Congratulations to all of the honorees, some really great talent. I think you guys did a great job um, really highlighting some of the great talent and up and coming uh, people in the labor movement. So my name is Pat Kane. I'm a registered nurse. I'm the executive director of the New York State Nurses Association. We're a statewide union of around 40,000 registered nurses and other healthcare professionals. Um, so optimism, um, I'd say for myself and I think for all of us um, and our sector, the vaccine uh, is definitely something to be really optimistic about. You know, I know I've been doing some volunteering in some of the vaccination pods and I have to say, I think that's been, um, it's but just been an incredible experience to be part of that effort. Um, and I think the other thing, you know, for us in particular is, um, you know, the pandemic certainly laid bare a lot of the inadequacies, a lot of the racial disparities in our healthcare system. Uh, and I think in this moment, you know, it's a time when a lot of the things that we've been talking about, the Nurses Association, I'm really optimistic that we can get a lot of those things addressed. And I think just the idea of workers being essential and, and folks really, um, unfortunately, you know, the sacrifices that we had to make in the labor movement to be there and to, um, you know, save about 140,000 New Yorkers. But, um, you know, I think it's finally clear what our role um, is here in New York. So thanks. Thank you, Pat. Over to uh, Wayne Spence, please introduce yourself and give us a reason for optimism. Yep. Thank you, and uh, thanks for having me. And 
I'm grateful that City and State is going to be recognizing one of Pep's own. Um, so again, I'm Wayne Spence, president of the Public Employees Federation. Uh, we're from Buffalo to Long Island. We represent the professional scientific and technical titles in New York State government. Uh, that's a mouthful. And um, I'm really glad, um, you know, to be president of this union. Um, I'm the first African-American uh, president of the union and the first union uh, president to be elected south of the Tappan Zee Bridge in PEPS. 40 uh, something years being a union. My reason for optimism, uh, for the people that you are actually highlighting, for what I saw this summer, what I saw that young folks have done, not across the country, but across the world, to recognize that on any given day back this summer, there were protests going on in about six or seven towns just on Long Island alone, then New York City in every borough, then Buffalo, then Syracuse. Then my kid is showing me pictures of what's going on in Paris and in Brazil. And it's, it was just phenomenal in the Philippines. It, it, it showed me, that's the optimism that the status quo is not gonna be around. Um, and, and that is why I also got optimism again, watching television the other night when King Harry recognized his own, uh, the ability that his privilege and recognized that, you know, his family missed an opportunity and the country missed an opportunity with Meghan Markle. So I think when people own that, there's optimism because nobody's now hiding it, you know, under a rug, it's coming forth. And that's my optimism because if you can own it, then we can deal with it and we can move forward. Thank you so much. Uh, over to Louis Picani. Please uh, introduce yourself and a reason for optimism. Well, first, I want to congratulate everybody that was uh, selected and nominated. And I'm actually honored to be with such a great panel. Um, really, everybody has labor in their heart, everybody on this panel. So uh, it, it's it really, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here tonight. Uh, my name is Louis Picani. I'm the president and principal officer of Teamsters Local 456. Uh, we're part of the International Brother of Teamsters. Um, optimism. I think, uh, in general, everybody is fed up, Mirror, mirroring what everybody is saying. And I think now with, uh, we need a change in the political environment. And I think we have to start holding all the politicians accountable for their actions because they all sit here, they'll put their arms around us, swear they're labor friendly. And as soon as they're elected, they do nothing for us. Um, I think President Biden is doing a great job already, starting to change some of the laws. Uh, he has a lot of work to do ahead of him, but uh, I think all of our, our local and uh, state officials should look at what's going on. Um, and everybody says the unions have declined, uh, especially since the 50s. We've declined because laws have been set up against us. That's the only reason. People want to be union. They want to get a better uh, life for themselves and their families. And the way to do that is to organize labor. And unfortunately, there's a lot of things holding us back from organizing. And I think um, it's time for a change. I think it's time for a, a, a labor revolution in this country. Um, like Brother Spence said, you looked at France, you looked around the world and, and people are, are rising up saying, we're not taking it anymore. And I think you're gonna see that moving forward. Um, thank you. Thank you. Over to Kyle Bragg, please. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I want to thank uh, City and State for hosting this every year um, uh, and celebrating our Labor's Rising Stars, particularly one of our own, uh, my Vice President and Political Director, Candace Tolliver. Um, I'm Kyle Bragg, and I'm President of uh, SEIU 32 BJ. We're a property service union of essential workers of about 175,000 across the East Coast, with 85,000 right here in the city. Uh, I grew up in the labor movement. Um, and I think what makes me uh, most optimistic about the future is several things. One, I think uh, what this pandemic has done is pull back the curtain on inequities that uh, a lot of my, my brothers and sisters already articulated uh, earlier. Uh, and that uh, people across the globe and in New America see that the labor movement is the way 
the, to attack uh, uh, social and economic injustices that exist for workers in this country and across the globe. And I, you can see now that the resurgence of the, of the labor movement is happening. People are, are, are going towards uh, labor, labor unions instead of going away from them. And the rhetoric of big corporations and companies is no longer working on workers because they see that the inequities continue to exist and that uh, the, disparate, the economic disparities uh, continue to grow, the, the wage disparities continue to grow from the top to the bottom. And so the answer to that is unions. And uh, I also am very encouraged that now we have these vaccines uh, that uh, we hope that it gets out to the population. Our members have just been included in that population. Uh, and this is a way I think that we will come out of this, this pandemic. And I, I encourage each and every essential worker who's eligible to go out there and, and get vaccinated because we have to continue to move out of this, this pandemic. We have to make sure that we keep our families, our friends, our co-workers safe, and this is the way to do it. So thank you. Thank you, and last but not least, over to Barbara Bowen. Great, oh, it's a great pleasure to be here tonight, to be with uh, labor comrades and colleagues. It's really wonderful. Thank you, city and state. Congratulations to all those honored and also all those under 40, even under 30 or over 40 who are part of this movement. Uh, we, you know, your pictures all don't turn up in city and state, but it's a very big movement. And that's uh, really thrilling for all of us. That in itself is a source of optimism. I'm especially uh, thrilled that one of our own, Stuart Davis, who's a rank and file organizer and worker and, uh, and a professor at CUNY is included among the honorees, also one from our statewide affiliate, NYSET, and several other CUNY graduates and others are here. The, the one from NYSET is Jake Crawford, so it's really great. Um, what gives me a sense of optimism tonight actually is in part listening to the unity of view among the others who've spoken. Um, I too was uh, going to speak about the fact that we have seen a real uh, exposure that finally there's been an exposure that I hope is unmissable of uh, how deeply racism structures our whole society, our economy, our universities, our healthcare system, our housing, every single part of what we live and do, uh, private as well as public. Um, and I think it's, it's so important, not only that that's been seen and seen at great cost, people have paid with their lives exposing that, but uh, seen and also that the response was an uprising. And um, that as several of you said, that labor is looking internationally, that we're looking at other places internationally, that we can't miss that, um, that this is a moment of possibility for uh, what, what you call Lewis labor revolution. I think it is a possibility of a, a period of movement and change and broader social, economic, political change. I think it's a moment where what's happened through this pandemic um, and the way popular movement has made it understood has revealed that what was normal is not what we are hoping to get back to. That that normal was killing some of us and was designed to kill some of us and we've got to change it. So that gives me optimism, that shared sense and that international sense and the movement that's represented. So, um, I, and also I'll just say one other thing that uh, there was cheering for workers, cheering for healthcare workers, cheering every night at seven o'clock for workers. We all know we have to go beyond cheering and we have to put something behind that, but the visibility of workers and healthcare workers in particular and the bonds between us, I think are a possibility that we must seize and amplify for real optimism. Thank you so much. A couple notes to the attendees. If you're on Zoom uh, and if you're in the chat, you know, please uh, toggle it so it's to panelists and attendees. So everybody who's uh, going can see your chat. Uh, Facebook, same thing, you know, feel free to talk to everybody. Um, and also I will be trying to pull some questions from the audience Q&A in Zoom. So if you have any questions, feel free to throw them in the Q&A, um, upvote your favorites and uh, I'll try and get to those later in the conversation. Uh, Back to this, I want to keep on talking about uh, about this past year and and reasons for optimism. Uh, you know, it's been a year with the pandemic, and I've heard both ways. Some people saying that the labor union is the labor movement is going to come out so much stronger 
Uh, in fact, some of you just did. And then some fears that the labor movement is going to come out weaker because of this. Uh, you know, we already talked a little bit about it, but I want to just expand on that. Does anybody have concerns here um, about uh, about the future, about maybe the the effect of the pandemic on either unionization overall or your specific sector? And I'll open that up to anybody. Um, okay, I'll go after oh. after Wayne. Yeah, please, oh, Wayne. Um, I think for most of the, I can think I can speak for almost everybody who's on this panel with me and a lot of the union leaders. Unions stepped up um, when employers uh, failed our members during the pandemic. From PPEs, we had to go out and source them uh, many times. Um, on numerous occasions, uh, lots of unions spend a lot of money that was not budgeted for to make sure our members um, you know, stayed safe. And I think for those people who were not in the union or might've been fee payers, they saw it. Um, we, all, we, we even gave the people, when we did distribution, it didn't matter what union you were in, we, gave, we distributed um, as much as we could. Uh, and I think um, we also showed up. Um, Bradley, one of the people that's been honored, even when before there was vaccine, he was out there uh, making sure that our members' rights uh, were protected because there were many times uh, management tried to take advantage of uh, the confusion. Uh, if anybody can remember back in March, April, and May, lots of confusion. Things change daily, sometimes hourly. And management tried to take advantage of that uh, with our members and suggested at many times would have been putting our members' uh, lives and their health and the health of their family. See, this didn't just affect us at the work site. This is one of those things that you can bring it back home and you know, your loved one, what you do at work could have a direct impact on the health and safety and your life of your loved ones back home. And so I believe the way the union showed up and the way we, we stood strong and pushed back. And at times, even when we were pushing back, we knew pushing back and saying no to management or this is ridiculous and even going to the press was not enough. You still had to go out and source things and get what was needed uh, for our members to do their jobs and to protect the community at large. And we did that. So I, I, I know I can speak from that point of view that this pandemic showed what it is to be in a union. Um, just uh, picking up on uh, Wayne's comments, I, I think it did show what it means to be in a union and what it means to be a worker and be collective. Um, one thing that I think we've all noticed is how much self-education went on how much we all had to learn. Maybe the Nisma uh, colleagues knew a lot of this before, but um, how much we all educated ourselves about health and safety on the job, how much we took that on and um, really uh, took responsibility and empowered ourselves through this moment as a response to failures by the employer that Wayne talked about. Um, but to go more specifically to your question, Jeff, about a concern, in our sector, I, I would say we have a concern in representing a university, a university that serves largely working class people, people of color and lower income people. Um, we have a lot of concern about the post pandemic university, that this crisis will be used by those in power as an opportunity to downscale, to uh, do shortcuts, to reduce services that were already reduced too far. And that the uh, kind of um, change the changes that many of those in power have been wanting to see will be easier to make post pandemic. So one of the concerns we have, and it might be echoed in other sectors, is uh, that this it's sort of shock doctrine fashion will be used to create um, a, a cheapened education or a degraded system as the post pandemic system. So I think we all have to fight against that with the optimism that we talked about earlier. So, um... Like so many of the union members that are represented by the leaders on this call, uh, 33J members have been on the front line of this pandemic from day one. We've unfortunately lost over 150 of our members to this, to this pandemic during this crisis, as I know many of us have experienced that pain. Um, but I, you know, our members uh, from day one are the ones who as many uh, have not been able to enjoy the benefit of working from home or remotely working. They had to be in the midst of it. Uh, and uh, I applaud them because, uh, you know, as the city was sheltering place, 
uh, it was our members that made life bearable in many uh, millions of, 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 of residents of the city. Uh, the, the, their work has increased exponentially. When you're talking about all the deliveries now that take place uh, as people are now at home and not going out, uh, security officers who have to uh, implement new security uh, protocols across Protocol. the city to make sure that people are safe. Our residential workers who keep people comfortable, safe and secure in their homes. Our commercial uh, building workers who are working and have been hit hardest in this layoff of uh, in the decimation of our commercial uh, uh, industry, uh, which still is somewhere at 10 or below percent occupancy. Um, which is devastating, and 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 uh, these are folks who will bring the confidence for people to come back into this space, which is important for our, our city's economy. Our city, uh, the commercial real estate market, is so important to drive the the economy of the city, and our members are at the heart of that by making and, and giving people the confidence to return to the commercial space because they're the ones that are that are securing those buildings, they're the ones that's cleaning them and making sure they're sterile, and all the new protocols that are in place to make, to build and to make the, uh, uh, people comfortable and build the confidence that they can return back uh, to, to the office space eventually as these, uh, um, as these uh, vaccines are now being more broadly uh, distributed. Um, and so, and, and at the same time, we're bargaining contracts for uh, 20,000 more members, 10,000 security officers, 10,000 airport workers, airport workers who continue to work uh, in our airlines to, to, to make sure that people who staff to continue to travel or who must travel uh, do so in a safe uh, environment, in the, in, in the safest way. And so, um, you know, I, I, essential workers are, are, are so, uh, as, as I think it was uh, Barbara who said it, yes, it's great that we applaud them at 7 p.m., but we have to continue to applaud them in more, in more than just uh, hand claps. We have to recognize that their services were uh, more than valuable, they're invaluable, and that uh, that uh, they deserve the recognition for keeping this country, our city, our states moving uh, in a time where uh, many uh, were uh, uh, able to do that from home. Our members had to do it on the job. Definitely interested in hearing from, from Pat, too. I mean, nurses, oh my gosh, been in the center of this for the past year. You know, is NYSDEN going to come out stronger or have there, have, have there been some struggles? Um, well, yes, there, Jeff, there's certainly have been a lot of struggles um, on the front line. I think our biggest concern right now is the recovery, um, you know, because it, and it's not over, right? I mean, we, we there's a lot of emphasis on the vaccine, but we still have members on the front line um, saving people, fighting to save people. Um, that still are, you know, uh, uh, afflicted with this disease. Uh, and I think that kind of gets lost. And I think like a lot of us talked about the hand clapping and a lot of that stopped now, right? So we don't have that. We don't have a lot of the things that, you know, people sending food and people sending things that were kind of boosting morale a little bit. And in some places, um, you know, a lot of the conditions that we saw, you know, look, we had to increase hospital capacity by 50%. Right, and we kept hearing about ventilators and and um, things like that, increasing bed capacity. Well, where was the staff going to come from? So, and we have seen a lot of retirements. We still see a lot of agency and temporary staff being utilized. Um, you know, what I do think personally, my biggest concern is the members themselves, and I feel like they haven't gotten a moment to recover. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of our employers have programs to try to support them, but unless that's really built into their day, Jeff, I don't see them able to get a breath or to even have the time. Um, you know, and oftentimes in healthcare, we're the last people to, to be taking care of ourselves, unfortunately. Um, and it's it's really concerning and we're gonna pay, a we're all gonna pay a price for that. Um, if we don't address what people on the front line have gone through, what they've been through, someone else was talking about how this affected our families and it absolutely did. I mean, we have members that feel um, you know, and not, you know, and it's not out far out there that they were the cause of their family members getting sick. You know, and when we started seeing what was happening and Barbara spoke about NISA and yes, we've always had a strong health and safety program. I mean, we said from the beginning what kind of respiratory protection was needed and still we're fighting at a federal level for that to be established. You know, 
all the things you've been saying all along, moving to reusable respiratory protection, we're still fighting these fights. And like, when is enough enough? Um, you know, in terms of what you expect people on the front line to sacrifice, to give, um, to keep people alive, which is really all we want to do. This isn't political for us at all. Um, you know, um, folks stepped up um, and, you know, you heard a lot of our nurses out there um, at the height of this saying how they felt they were sent into battle without, um, you know, without, without the proper weapons to defend themselves and fight this thing. So good news is we're doing, you know, we have much better treatments. People are doing better when they get sick, but we're still fighting and there are still things that we need um, that aren't being addressed. Um, and the psychological toll this has taken on the front line really needs to be addressed. Well said. Yeah, if, you, if you forgive me, I just quickly, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that we have school janitors who uh, also have uh, committed themselves uh, to making a school safe for our students and our teachers to return to, to those classrooms. Uh, incredible, incredible work every day. Got to gotta love the school janitors, of course. Now, it's been so interesting uh, from my perspective as a journalist where unionization has, at least it seems to have been growing in the past few years. We've seen some major publications uh, and the writers unionizing and there's there's been a real uh, grassroots movement there. Um, but I get the impression that that's not true uh, for workers as a whole across either the state of New York, which is one of the most unionized states or across the nation. Um, I wanna ask about this and I'll go to Lewis first. Uh, you know, do you expect uh, the percentage of unionized workers to, to grow in the coming decade? Or uh, are we continuing to see uh, a shrinkage of, of the sector? Uh, before I answer that, I just want to introduce uh, Dominic Casanelli Jr. He's Teamsters Local 456 as vice president and honoree tonight. Uh, I'm so proud of all the hard work he does, the drive and the love in his heart for this labor movement. Um, and I, I, I can honestly say I love him like a son. Um, he, he's tremendous. He's, he's phenomenal at the work he does. Um, uh, so thank, thank you, you Dominic. Um, I, I see actually- in For our 40 uh, nominees who are, who are not on camera right now. So thank you for, for representing everybody. <laughs> Sorry, back to you, Lewis. Uh, and I, I think we're gonna see a, an increase in the labor movement. And one reason this pandemic did was show that all workers are essential. You know, beforehand they would take, you would do your job. People took advantage of you or just ignored what you did. Uh, we represent 42 municipalities, um, bus companies, detention officers, heavy highway, oil, building material. All were part of, of this pandemic of keeping the country moving. So, you know, uh, you, you go in the morning, you throw your garbage out, you just come home from work, you know it's gone. But as people were quarantining and sick in their houses, throwing waste out to the ground, we were exposed to that. Mm -hmm. and, and like the brothers and sisters said prior, you know, bringing it home to our families. Um, and, you know, yeah, we're essential, but then when we're looking to get vaccinated, you're not that essential. So we weren't some of the mm -hmm. vaccinated. And it's a shame. And in our work, in our line of work, none of us look for a pat on the back. Nobody looks for acclimates saying, oh, you did a great job, but recognize us when we have to be recognized. So don't just use us as a, a tool for, you know, for the media to just say, oh yeah, we're going on. Uh, and I'm afraid of now um, when this is over, you know, you're essential now, not over because I don't think it's ever going away, but how essential are we gonna be? Are they gonna look for cutbacks and layoffs and downsizing um, because it's not, uh, a pandemic at this moment. And that's what we have to stop. And I, and I believe everybody that's involved um, in this labor movement is gonna make sure that it does not happen. Uh, and you know, for the municipal workers, the stimulus money should protect them for now. Um, but again, it's labor who always uh, kicks up to save uh, the membership, you know, with the PPE came out of the union's money. Um, Corporations, development, developers, all they should start fucking up. It, it cannot always be on the working men and women back. You know, it, it, it has to change. So yes to your question, I do see us picking up our membership and getting stronger. I do. 
Anyone else on this, please? Well, um, if I can, you know, Jeff, we're, we're I know my union, uh, we're fighting a, a budget right now. I, I just participated up in Rockland where they're closing, they're gonna close a children's psychiatric center, even though we're hearing how adolescent uh, suicide is up. And if they close it, that means there will be nothing from White Plains all the way up to Utica for adolescents residential mental health treatment. But, you know, but, but we, again, and those work, who do it? The, the workers, those essential workers and the parents who are blue collared or marginal in terms of in the economic runs are the ones that are, who need those services. But, I, but that work is not sexy. So what am I saying that? It is not a new airport. It is not a bridge. And I'm saying, when are we going to really look at what is necessary? They used as a they used data saying that the, the facility was underutilized. I don't know how it could be underutilized. They purposely did it because there's lots of adolescents that were sitting in ERs waiting to go into residential treatment. So don't tell me it was unutilized. And if that's data, then I know for a fact that lots of bridges and airports were underutilized, but yet we have a budget that's calling for more bridges and, and, and more infrastructure when it comes to airports, because it's not sexy. I use that term, right? Because it's not shiny. We have a culture where we, we seem to reverence that shiny penny and that older penny that's been around and around and now gets dull. Nobody wants to look at it. But if the two pennies, if you look at them, don't they have the same value? And I do believe that if you talk, if you talk about value, wasn't the essential workers and those people that need those services, the one that you call heroes. So why are we devaluing them now and treating them like zeros? And, and I want and that's 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 the problem for me when I see what's going on. And, and Lewis alluded, I've said that also. Literally, we were essential, but we weren't essential when it came to who got to got the, the vaccine. It's the ultra rich again who find a way how to play the game. It is the ultra rich again that's going to benefit from these infrastructure works that that's in the budget now. And that's, that has to stop. That really has to stop. Pat, of course. Yeah, I just want to give a shout out to my political director that's part of this great group tonight, Michelle Krenzel. And, you know, I interviewed Michelle right before the pandemic. And Michelle, and I know you uh, highlighted this in her bio, and with everything going on in New York, Michelle came here to help us and be part of our team at the New York State Nurses Association. And I just wanted to really shout her out because I think everything we've been through and all the fighting that we've done, um, you know, thank you so much for honoring our political directors. It's been, it's been great to have Michelle with us and, you know, her courage and her fierceness at coming to New York in the middle of this thing was um, really something. So thanks. Any, any other thoughts on, uh, on the, the growth or, or shrinking of the, uh, the labor sector or unionization overall? Well, I, I, I'd say that um, <clears throat> during this pandemic is the most challenging environment that any union could be in uh, to organize. We've uh, been uh, wildly successful in continuing to organize low wage workers at the airports. And uh, we continue to grow that sector and, and bring uh, um, uh, workers into uh, 32J into the union, I said earlier, we're bargaining a contract for over 10,000 of those workers. Uh, workers that will now not only have a, a, a family sustaining wages, but have health care. And we know how vitally important health care is uh, as this pandemic has pulled back the curtain on the great disparities that exist uh, in our communities. Uh, and so uh, I think that we are moving forward, uh, the labor movement will continue to move forward. And I think that people see the labor movement as the answer all in, to the inequities that exist, and that the big corporations uh, have uh, had their way long enough. Uh, and I, I know and I feel very confident uh, that as we continue to talk to workers, fast food workers in the city uh, uh, who, uh, who are desperate uh, to organize and be recognized uh, for the labor that they, that they have uh, provided during this crisis. Uh, you know, we have companies like Chipotle who have uh, had skyrocketing profits, but yet treat their workers uh, so very poorly. Um, you know, we 
we've uh, fought uh, and continue to fight uh, for all these essential workers, not just our workers, but all essential workers have access to the vaccine. And that's why I really have to shout out uh, Candace Tolliver, who's been doing incredible work uh, 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 trying to deliver uh, these, these, these benefits to essential workers uh, in, in our city. Her and her entire team, uh, you know, we're in this together. This is not about this essential worker against that essential worker. We know all essential workers need to be lifted up, recognized, supported, and 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 applauded uh, uh, through the ways that we should applaud them. Having good family sustaining jobs, quality, affordable health care for themselves and their families, and PPE until we get out of this crisis. Uh, and that we shouldn't have to beg for these things. It should be a right and some entitlement for these workers. Now, you said until we get out of this crisis. I want to ask a question about that. I actually pulled from the audience Q&A. Uh, somebody's asking about uh, de Blasio's recent comments that he's going to ask city workers to go back to work in offices by May. And uh, also that the mayor said, keep your masks on until June. Um, this this questioner is basically wondering if, if you know you think that your workers are ready to go back to work by May uh, in 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 offices, in person, that sort of thing. Uh, wondering if any of you have, have thoughts on this. It's not fair for me because my network has already been there. <laughs> so I'll right. let someone else answer this. Right. I was going to say that a lot of us, and, and just let me say on um, your last question when we're talking about uh, is the labor movement shrinking or expanding, let's just say Bessemer, Alabama, and uh, Amazon organizing. And uh, you know, I hope that is the harbinger of great expansion. Um, but on your really, the uh, question from the uh, attendee, that's great, thanks for the question. Um, I think the first answer is that a lot of workers here, I think in every one of our unions, I mean, we've heard it very particularly from some of the unions tonight, haven't stopped working on in person since this began. And even for us in the university, we have a lot of uh, workers who have been working on campus the whole time. Um, and there are several, I mean, obviously there's some other unions here for whom that's not even a question. Um, and I think that's telling because there's a lot of emphasis on going back to work. Um, and I think that largely refers to people who have had the, the privilege to work from home in a certain kind of job and haven't had to be working the whole time. So one thing I would say is let's not invisibilize, and I know the questioner wasn't, but just to the general public, let's not invisibilize those who've been working the whole time. It isn't a question of going back. Uh, for a lot of working class people, people really exposed either healthcare workers or building workers or sanitation or uh, people in congregate se sections, um, as I said, and this is yours are Wayne. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing I would say is I'd like to reframe the question. It's, it shouldn't be really are our members ready to go back to work, but are the workplaces ready for people to work there? Yes. So, are they safe? Because it is the employer's obligation to provide a safe and healthy workplace under the law. That's the employer's obligation. And it's, it's too often flipped around to be a psychological question or a question of courage or something for the individual worker. Are you ready to go back? I mean, we should all be asking and should be able to do whatever it takes to inspect and monitor, is the workplace ready? So is the ventilation up to the ASHRAE standards, the national standards is, and it's not just distancing, it's ventilation. Have people had access to vaccines? Are all, is there clean drinking water in every place? Are the bathrooms working? I mean, some very basic questions. So I would say the question is uh, to the employers and to the city uh, in, your, in the case of your, the question, um, we better make sure that every workplace is safe and that there's testing and follow-up and tracing um, and that should be the real question when it's safe and when uh, workers are entitled to check that it's safe and have real inspections, then, then we can ask that question. I wanna move on to other questions, but that definitely seems like a great thorough answer. I mean, just wonder if anybody else has any quick thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, like just to Barbara's point, I mean, we were just talking about this, right? We're still fighting for the federal government to address appropriate mandatory standards. I don't think anyone should be going back into these workplaces until we at least have that. And we've all seen, I mean, I'm sure all of us have filed OSHA complaints and you know we've all seen how that um, has failed us. So 
there are things that need to be in place to protect workers before they go back into these workplaces. And so far it's, you know, it, it, we haven't seen as much as we need to see. I would only add in the private uh, real estate market that uh, we really enjoyed a, a very good relationship with the industry and creating protocols and instituting the protocols that do make it safe for people in the private sector at least to uh, uh, access uh, the, these spaces again. Uh, and we've been doing that from day one in the residential sector and in, in the schools. Um, and so, but I agree that we have, you know, we have to, we have to, we have to ensure the safety of everyone because the, if, if we don't, then we're not going to come out of this and we should not put people's lives at risk. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm very proud of my membership. I'm very proud of our industry and working hand in hand with us to make sure that we create the protocols that uh, create the most safe environment for people to return. Thank you. Now we see a couple questions in the chat uh, asking about the the PRO Act, uh, this federal mm -hmm. legislation which passed the House. It's being considered in the Senate, I believe. Um, and they're asking, what are the possibilities of the legislative approach uh, being a galvanizing force for pro labor sentiment in the aftermath of Trump? It's a great mm -hmm. question. I know uh, that maybe, I mean, I certainly don't follow Washington politics very closely. I'm very focused on city and state politics, but I'm wondering if any of you have been following that legislation and have some thoughts on, on that. Well, if I, I, I just say, I, I haven't followed cl as close as I should be, but you know, I know International has been very much engaged in, 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 in driving. Uh, this legislation to uh, continue to lift unions up, but I, I, but like you, Jeff, I'm very interested in our city. I mean, uh, we we've been able to institute uh, in our city, you know, uh, in our state, Health and Terminals Act, which will help healthcare to airport workers, paid sick leave uh, for 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 workers here in this city, just cause legislation, uh, and and Fair Work Week for fast food workers. Uh, this is the way. I mean, uh, this is the way that we lift workers up. I, Every worker has, has the right to organize and be part of a union, but every worker should have the same rights as every other worker for dignity and respect on the job. And these are some of the ways that we've been able to accomplish that through legislation. And I, and I think this is a huge step forward uh, uh, that's coming from the federal government. And I applaud the Biden uh, 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 administration for jumping out so early in this administration for doing the things that uh, lift up workers and, and changing uh, uh, the horrible uh, uh, attack uh, that workers have been under in this country. And, and, and I also would say that, uh, you know, in, in his first 100 days, he's attacking and using his executive powers in a way that uh, really uh, validates our, our support and our members' hard work to get them elected. Uh, and we have a, a, a union of, I said, brown and, black and brown workers and immigrant workers, and he is, he is really turned around uh, uh, some of the horrible, horrible, atrocious uh, policies that have been that we've seen come out of the, the former Trump administration. Appreciate that. Now we've got time for like one more question. We're running out of time already. But uh, look, the uh, the 2021 elections in New York City are happening in in just uh, three months and two weeks. Uh, but who's counting? <clears throat> And I want to ask about this, this trend I've seen of, of a lot of unions uh, partnering up. Uh, we've seen some joining together to make mm -hmm. joint endorsements uh, with a couple of yours, in fact. Uh, and we've seen all the, the labor unions really getting involved in endorsing whole slates of city council candidates uh, and, and more. So I'd like to, to go around and actually hear from all of you. Uh, number one, uh, if you could name just you know one candidate, whether it's city council level, mayor, or anything else that uh, everybody uh, listening in should pay attention to, should should keep their eye on one candidate, and then also just some quick thoughts on uh, you know the the labor movement uh, coalescing or working together here. Oh, Wayne, please. Yeah. So I I know we came out early uh, for our union um, on the mayoral race. Now, as a state union, we usually don't get involved really that much. In city politics, um, um, usually it's Senate or Assembly or, or congressional districts. But um, we saw what Eric did during the pandemic. Uh, when Downstate Medical Center, when I got word that they only had one day's worth of um, N95s, and when I saw pictures of uh, some of the nurses wearing garbage bags because they had no gowns, I made the phone call to Eric, and Eric uh, called 
who he needed to call and got things out. He actually made sure that the nurses at Downstate uh, got fed. Uh, and th by the way, this was a hospital. If you remember, I was in a fight with a governor in 2012. We did sittings to save that hospital. That hospital was scheduled for closure. Now imagine if that hospital had closed, which is what the governor and, and, and wanted. Who would have served that community? which was still underserved even with that hospital because we know how many people died. And so because of what Eric did, um, we recognized and, 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 and threw our support behind him. It wasn't, we didn't wait for somebody to just come and visit me now. We recognized for a fact that as before he was even mayor, or, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak into existence to a certain degree, he was there for, my mem for our members. So it, it, it wasn't something that, oh, politics. This was just real life. He was there from day one for essential workers. And so we went in that route and we did it early. And, uh, and some, so I got some pushback for it. And I had to remind people, here's why. Let's, let me explain to you why. And by the way, Pef was one of the first union to endorse um, who is now um, Chuck Schumer way back when, when he was the underdog in third place. And look Never where he's at now. We yeah. were the first union. So no, I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, I want to hear from everybody. So uh, anybody else, please tell a, a candidate and, and thoughts on, you know, the 2021 elections. It's, it's hard for me to just call out a candidate, but what mm -hmm. I can say is that I've had the pleasure of working with my sister, Pat and Neisner and, and you know, in this important uh, moment that we're in where we're going to turn over, you know, a vast majority of the city council and we, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, you know, all the great uh, legislation that we've been able to pass uh, in that progressive council, uh, and that's due to work uh, that, uh, and I gotta could give another shout out to Candace Tolliver for incredible work in uh, working with those with those uh, city council folks and legislators to pass these uh, pro-worker uh, legislations. And, you know, we believe that working together, we need to make sure that this continues to be the focus of the city council to put workers first. And so that's why we came together with other of, of our of like minded friends in the labor movement where we could could do that and uh, and 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 find space to work together in endorsing uh, uh, city council candidates who we believe will uh, uh, again uh, put labor and working people in the city first. You know, uh, go ahead, Pat. Uh, I just wanted to say, you know, it's been great to be part of um, Labor Strong and be in the coalition um, with Kyle and his members and all the Teltrades and um, CWA and all these folks. Um, you know, and I, I agree with um, Kyle. I can't name one person. I mean, we've done like a hundred screenings. And I think the idea, the, the optimism that Barbara and everybody was talking about, you know, that in itself, right? There's so many great people and really people that came from people who are active in their community um, that are you know, putting themselves out there to run, I think that's another reason to really be um, excited. And it's just, you know, it's been incredible. It's been a lot of work, um, you know, all these screenings, but really so many talented people have come forward and that's another reason to be really excited and optimistic, but I can't name one of them. <laughs> Go ahead, Barbara. I was just gonna go exactly where you were. Um, and it's not just being diplomatic, but um, it's really because there is a kind of um, resurgence, I think, and, and this is city and state. So I'm gonna say something about the state level. Um, you know, in the last round of state elections, we saw um, a, a real change in the state legislature and some grassroots candidates coming in and there are more this time and there are more of those candidates coming in or also uh, meeting with our folks uh, for city council endorsements and city council future work. Um, and I think that's the exciting thing that we should watch the candidates whom we did support. And I think we've also heard all tonight that you know our main work is the actualization and support and, and um, energizing and organizing of our own members, right? That's, that's labor, that's where we centrally are. We, we have to rely on our own organization and power. That's the real power of the labor movement. Uh, but I think there is a lot to look at and to keep our eyes on. There were candidates who were grassroots candidates who were striving, who were left candidates, not just progressive, but left candidates uh, for state office. And they're up there right now, uh, working on those state budgets right now. We have a big opportunity this year for lots of reasons, but one is that there's a coalition that's pushing for serious end of tax breaks to the rich in Albany. We do not have a progressive tax system in this state and all of the places we work would be better served 
if the state had the revenue it should on an annual basis, not just an influx one time from the federal government. So I think watching what the candidates we have, a lot of us have supported to put in office, uh, those grassroots candidates, what they're already doing and um, pushing them to go as far as they can. This is the year to aim high, to be ambitious. And I, that's what we're watching. And Lewis, I know you're mostly a Hudson Valley union, but uh, any, any thoughts here? Oh, that we're gonna, I would have to refer to our joint council 16 who does a tremendous job, you know, uh, down in the city. So um, I'll go with what uh, Sister Bowen said about our state legislation that, that was elected. We do have a, a big change up there and we do have people that are stepping up and they're not afraid to come out to uh, against the political, uh, what would be politically correct. They're, they're actually putting people over politics. So that's a change and we're seeing that. And um, just recently we, we had a rally in the city of Mount Vernon real quick and uh, about workers not getting paid. And uh, Senator Biagi stood up and she came forward and, and just like basically called everybody out. It's not right, it's not right. So uh, we do have some, you know, a change coming and, and it's looking for the people and for organized labor. So. Thank you. And uh, guys, I just wanna thank all of you so much for, for joining on this panel, for, for sharing your, your thoughts on the labor movement and your own stories. Uh, of course, now I want to move on to everybody's favorite uh, section of the event where I have to read 40 whole names. Yay. So congratulations so much to everybody in advance. And uh, I seriously apologize if I mispronounce her name. Normally before this, I would mingle around the room and be like, hey, by the way, how do you pronounce your name? <laughs> no mingling tonight. But uh, without further ado, for Labor 40 Under 40, I want to honor Eric Antokol, the Assistant Vice President of Programs for Non-Traditional Employment for Women. Anthony Beckford, Community Advocate, Mentor, and Independent Entertainment Booking Agent, uh, who also, I believe, is running for City Council. Uh, Angel Benitez, Second Vice President of Local 420, DC 37, AFSME. Uh, Grace Bogdanova, Vice President of 1199-SEIU-HWE. And I'm seeing lots of cheers in the chat. Please keep that going. I wish that we could all be cheering out loud together. Uh, Derek Bowers, Director of Social Enterprise or CEO NYC. Oh, of CEO NYC, the Center for Employment Opportunities. Derek Bowers. Uh, Dominic Casanelli Jr., Vice President of Teamsters Local 456, who I think we have right here. Uh, Susan Castle, Political Action Coordinator of CSEA. Manuel Castro, Executive Director of New Immigrant Community Empowerment, or NICE. Orlando Charles, the Chow Coordinator for the Restaurant Opportunity Center, Rock NY. Uh, Nuzat Chowdhury, the Legislative Council in a new, a Legislative Council in the New York City Council. Uh, Kelly Coughlin, Deputy Director of Labor Relations for the MTA Metro North Railroad. Railroad. Jacob Crawford, PSA Secretary Treasurer of the Professional Staff Association of NYSUT. Mm -hmm. Michelle Krenzel, NYSNA Political Director, got a shout out already. Carla Cruz, Assistant Director, Legislation and Policy at the Greater New York Laborers. Aaron Darcy, Director of Government Affairs at the Consortium for Worker Education. Stuart Davis, Vice Chair of PSC CUNY at Baruch in particular. Uh, Eric Dinowitz, a DOE public school teacher and a member of UFT also running for city council. Uh, Jenny Encolata Malinowski, Director of Community Outreach at Laborers Local 1010. Laura Gabby, a carpenter with Carpenters Local 157, the United Brotherhood of Carpenters. I think she was the one that was wearing a hard hat in her picture in the magazine. So shout out especially to Laura if that was you. Uh, and speaking of which, uh, I do know that if you wanna follow along, uh, you can go to city and state, check out the Labor 40 Under 40 list to look at all of the, the bios and the pictures. And I believe uh, the link was dropped in the chat as well. So please check that out uh, as, you, as you listen to my, me run down the names. Uh, let's see, we are halfway. Gabriel Gallucci, Director of Government Affairs at the Council of School Supervisors and Administrators. Leilani Irvin, uh, the Director of Homeless Services in the New York City Mayor's Office. Karina Kaufman Gutierrez, Deputy Director of the Street Vendor Project. Bradley Kolb, Field Representative for the Public Employees Federation. We got Wayne right here with PEF. Uh, Rebecca Lamort, Legislative and Communications Coordinator with the Greater New York LECET. 
also running for city council, Rebecca Lamort. Amy Leibowitz, account supervisor with Berlin Rosen in my email inbox all the time. Uh, Ross Lieblich, uh, labor relations specialist with NYSUT. Ryan McGarry, community and government relations specialist with the Suffolk AME. Miranda Nelson, New York and New Jersey director of Jobs to Move America. Leah Oaken, business representative with IATSE Local 764. Jeffrey Omura, chair of the International Actors Committee uh, of the Actors Equity Association, also a city council candidate right here on the Upper West Side. Uh, Daniel Pollack, uh, associate commissioner with the New York City Office of Labor Relations. Ooh, I love talking to folks at L OLR, so shout out there. Connor Shaw, assistant political director and business agent of the International Union of Journeymen and Allied Trades. Uh, Nagma Singh, legislative assistant at the New York State AFL-CIO. Shout out to everybody here. Uh, Bob Tiberwal, the deputy political director at the New York Hotel Trades Council. Candace Tolliver, vice president with 32BJ SEIU. Got a shout out there. Uh, Ryan Trevas, the business services representative of the New York State Department of Labor. Erica Vargas, Assistant Director of Political Action and Legislation at DC 37. Patrick Weisensall, Vice President with CWA Local 1168. Andrew Weber, Project Manager at Ahern Painting Contractors, Inc. And last but certainly not least, friend of mine, Megan Wiley, Political Action Coordinator at the New York City and Vicinity District Council of Carpenters. All 40, congratulations so much to all of our 40 honorees, the Labor 40 Under 40. This is a relatively new tradition for New York's, uh, for city and state, but uh, it's, it's a great one. And I'm sure that we'll keep on going and next year we'll do it in person. Uh, I also really wanted to thank once again, our sponsors tonight, uh, Locals Teams, Teamsters Local 456, the UFT and Local 768 Fiatsi. So thank you so much to our sponsors. We've got them in the chat as well. And uh, hey, if this Zoom wasn't enough, please tune in tomorrow. City and State's hosting uh, another installment of our Ranked Choice voting series. We're gonna have a couple mayoral candidates talking about RCV at 2 p.m. That's online. Uh, you can check out the event in the chat here or online at City and State New York, cityandstateny.com slash events. Uh, and on Friday, we're doing an event with AARP about home essentials. So that's like internet, utilities, uh, dealing with all of that in the pandemic with lots of star state legislators. That's going to be a great conversation. And uh, next week, we're hosting a nonprofit board con at 1 p.m. So if any of you are involved in the nonprofit sector, these events are wonderful. It's great networking. It's great information. So again, I'm Jeff Colton, a senior reporter at City and State. I want to thank once again our five incredible panelists for sharing their time, sharing their thoughts on the labor movement. And uh, of course, thank everybody for tuning in today and joining city and state and honoring our labor 40 under 40 rising stars. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for letting us be here.